Chapter 5 of Brazilian Goldmine Mystery by Andy Adams. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 The Spotted Terror. That jog from Kamuka's hand gave Biff a sudden idea. Biff was holding the mirror so it threw a big spot of sunlight on the hut wall. The spot wavered when Kamuka jogged Biff's arm, and Urubu was only a dozen feet from the corner of the hut. Biff changed the mirror's angle just a slight degree, spotting the light square in Urubu's eyes. That reflected glint of the sun was enough. Urubu dropped back, flinging his arm upward to shield his vision. Mr. Whitman came to his feet and grappled for the shotgun. A few seconds later, Mr. Brewster had pitched into the struggle. They disarmed Urubu, who stood by glaring suddenly. Biff and Kamuka approached the group, and Jacome, who had pulled the canoe on shore, came up behind them. "'You know what the name Urubu means?' Biff, Kamuka, asked. Biff shook his head. "'It means vulture,' the Indian boy said. A chuckle came from Jacome. "'A good name for Urubu. He is like one vulture.' At close range, Urubu looked the part. He had a profile like a buzzard's. He stood by, a sullen look on his face, as Mr. Whitman told Mr. Brewster. I turned down Urubu as a guide because he lied to me. He said he had guided safaris for the past five years, when part of that time he was in jail. Then he told our porters that I lied to them. You did put in Urubu. You said that Senor Brewster would arrive three days ago. Instead, he has arrived only now, as you can see. Urubu repeated those remarks to the native bearers in a mixture of Portuguese and Indian dialect. He was dumbfounded when Mr. Brewster spoke to them in the same manner. Mr. Brewster's words brought a murmur of approval. They want to be paid for the days they waited, Mr. Brewster told Mr. Whitman. I said we would pay them, and they are satisfied. Do you need Urubu as a guide? I should say not. Then we can send him away again. That was unnecessary. When Mr. Brewster turned to speak to Urubu, the troublemaker was gone. He had made a quick departure by the nearest jungle path. Mr. Whitman promptly called for Louise, the new guide, to step forward, and a small, bowing native came from the group of bearers. Since it was not yet noon, Mr. Brewster ordered Lewis to get everything ready for an immediate start. Soon the native bearers, more than a dozen in number, were hoisting their packs and other equipment. Meanwhile, Biff was present at a last-minute conference between his father and Hal Whitman. "'We'll follow our original plan,' stated Mr. Brewster. "'If we strike off to the northwest and follow the regular trails, we will appear to be looking for... Balata, like any other rubber-hunting expedition. Biff knew that the term Balata referred both to the rubber tree and its juice. He watched Hal Whitman mop perspiration from his forehead. Whitman's worry seemed to vanish with that process. We will be following the long side of a triangle, Biff's father continued, while Joe Nara is going around by the Rio Negro, turning north after he passes Sao Gabriel, so we know exactly where to meet him. That will be at Piedra del Cuchay. That's better than floundering around the headwaters of the Rio Negro, Whitman agreed. I was afraid we would be on a wild goose chase trying to find him there. It's lucky you met up with Nara. Let's say Nara met up with us, Mr. Brewster chuckled. We'll meet again at Piedra del Cruce, providing Nara dodges those headhunters. Since the rapids will delay him, we should reach the great rock as soon as Nara does. I'll talk to Luis and see if he knows the best route. Not yet, warned Mr. Brewster. Wait until we are deep in the jungle, with no chance of any spies being about, before we even mention Piedra del Cuchu. Do you understand? The final query was meant for Biff as well as Mr. Whitman. Biff nodded, then went to join Kamuka, who was waiting to help him get his pack on his back. That done, they fell into the procession as it started out. The first few miles gave Biff the false impression that a jungle trek was easy. The trail was smooth, well-trodden by multitudes of natives who had scoured the back country in search of Balata. 
but as paths diverged, they became rougher. Biff began stumbling over big roots that crossed the path, and when he kept his eyes turned down to watch for them, he lost sight of the bearers ahead of him and had trouble getting into line behind them. Once, Biff lost the trail entirely, and Kamuka overtook him just as he was blundering squarely into a fallen tree. The obstacle was at shoulder level, and Kamuka, sighting the bearers taking a turn in the path beyond, suggested, We climb over, take short way back to trail. Biff pressed aside some projecting branches as he clambered across the tree trunk, pack and all. His hands became sticky with some clinging substance. Spider web, thick here, Kamuka said. He helped Biff brush away the fine spun threads and pointed into the sunlight that filtered through the jungle foliage. Glistening between the tree branches were the largest, thickest spider webs that Biff had ever seen. There were multitudes of them forming what at first glance seemed to be an impassable barrier. Kamuka settled that problem by clearing away the obstructing branches with hard, expert slashes of his machete, taking the webs with them. The trail had become so irregular that the bearers frequently had to hack their way through the thick growth. Kamuka did the same, and Biff tried to copy the Indian youth's smooth style. Kamuka handled his machete easily, despite the pack that he carried. But with Biff, the pack shifted at every swing, and its strap cut into his back and shoulders. Big Jacome was doing most of the trailblazing, with Kamuka close behind him. Mr. Brewster and Mr. Whitman did their share, while urging the bearers to take their turns at the work. All responded willingly, with the exception of the guide, Luiz, who was lagging behind. "'What's holding you back, Luiz?' Whitman demanded. "'Why don't you get up ahead and take a hand at cutting the trail?' "'You pay others to cut trail, senor,' returned Luiz. "'You pay me to be guide, no?' Biff's father overheard the argument and provided a prompt solution. Since you are the guide, he told Lewis, suppose you show us the trail. Possibly we have lost it. You lead, we will follow. Mr. Brewster spoke in the Brazilian dialect that the bearers understood. Their solemn faces broadened at the expense of Lewis. Angrily, the undersized guide shouldered his way to the head of the line and began hacking at the brush with Jacome. Biff caught up with Kamuka, who had waited while Louise went by. "'You see his face?' asked Kamuka. "'Louise is very mad. "'He does not like hard work.' The glower that Louise gave over his shoulder proved that Kamuka's opinion was correct. The keen-eyed Indian boy was quick to note that Biff's face also wore a pained expression, but for a different reason. Understandingly, Kamuka said, "'You have trouble with pack?' I fix it. Expertly, he adjusted the straps to the fraction of an inch. From then on, the pack seemed to fit to Biff's back, giving him no more aches. What amazed Biff, though, was the fact that Kamuka's pack had no straps, but was laced to his back by crude ropes made from jungle vines. Yet it seemed to adjust itself to every move that Kamuka made. Soon the going became easier underfoot, and the path was free of obstacles. It was no longer necessary to hack through the jungle growth. Louise, bring us back to better trail, Kamuka confided to Biff. Less work for Louise. It was less work for Biff, too, though he didn't say so. He was pleased because his father had handled the situation so neatly. Biff noted the happy grins on the faces of the bearers every time Mr. Brewster moved back and forth among them. Biff grinned too when his dad came by and gave him an encouraging whack on the pack which now seemed moulded to Biff's body. It takes a few days to get into the swing of a safari, Mr Brewster stated, so don't be discouraged. Even the native bearers are struggling a bit, though they won't admit it. We'll call it a day as soon as we reach a suitable campsite. About an hour later, the safari halted. Gratefully, the bearers eased their packs to the ground and began to set up camp at Whitman's direction on a high bank above a jungle stream. The insects were bothersome as they had been at intervals along the route, but the expedition was equipped to meet that problem. 
the packs contained netting for the sleeping hammocks as well as insect repellent. The chief feature of the campsite was its closeness to a waterhole. Luis approved this, making a great show of his official title of guide. Biff, glad to be free of his pack, eagerly volunteered to help Kamuka bring up pails of water from the stream below. Halfway down, Kamuka hissed for a quick halt. We go back up quick, he said to Biff. We tell Senor Brewster that we see tapir at waterhole. Kamuka pointed out a pair of curious dark brown animals with clumsy, bulky bodies, stocky legs, and long snouted heads. The creatures were feeding on the leaves of young trees and appeared somewhat tame. Kamuka took no chance on frightening them away, however, as he beckoned Biff up the path. Mr. Brewster promptly picked up a loaded rifle and accompanied the boys down the path. The tapirs were already lumbering into the brush when Biff's father took quick but accurate aim on one of the animals and fired. One tapir dropped in its tracks while its companion crashed madly into the jungle. The boys rushed down to the bank and found that the tapir was shot squarely through the head. When Mr. Brewster joined them, he smiled. That's the only way to shoot a tapir, he declared. Otherwise, they blunder into the jungle wounded, and you can never find them. They have thick hides like a hippopotamus. In fact, they belong to the same family. That night, the members of the safari feasted on tapir steaks, which they broiled on the prongs of long forked sticks. Later, they went to sleep around the same campfire. All day, Biff had listened to the chatter of monkeys and the screech of birds. Now, howls of jungle animals seemed tuned to the heavy basso chorus of frogs from the stream below. But despite that, Biff was soon sound asleep, the crackle of the campfire blending with his last waking moments. Some hours later, he woke up suddenly. The jungle concert had ended, and the flames had settled to a low, subdued flicker. Somebody should have tended the fire, Biff thought. He recalled his father discussing that point with Louise shortly after they had finished dinner. Biff rolled from his hammock and groped towards some logs that lay beside the fire. There he halted at sight of what appeared to be two live coals glinting from a big log. Biff pulled back his hand just in time as the log came alive with a snarl. Biff realized that he had encountered some prowling beast of prey. He raised the alarm with a loud shout. Dad, there's something here by the fire. Before Biff could complete the sentence, he saw that the creature was a huge jungle cat, its tawny yellow coat spotted black. Already it was poising for a spring. Biff, caught unarmed, was confronted by an attacking jaguar, one of the jungle's most ferocious killers. Biff heard an answering call from his father. Then, before Mr. Brewster could have possibly found time to grab his gun, the jaguar sprang. End of chapter 5